So far, the defense has presented five of its 14 witnesses. Thanks to newspaper articles and the often told story, we were able to find telltale signs of editing in the transcript of their testimonies. But for the most part, these five have been pretty much straightforward. This is about to change. The testimonies of the next nine witnesses and the rest of the transcript are a bit confusing and are very convoluted. We believe that this is because the transcript from this point on has been heavily edited and or redacted. For example, the testimonies of the next two witnesses, John Robinson and Martin Branham, both stand out in the transcript for the same oddities. First, they are extremely short and tell us nothing of importance. In fact, the only thing they tell us is that Ira Mullins was a moonshiner. This fact had been established early in the trial with the testimony of Magistrate John Vint Bentley. Other witnesses had also testified about Ira's illicit moonshining. This had included the testimony about the incident in which Ira was thought killed. This incident was the one that had left Ira Mullins a paraplegic. But more importantly, neither testimony tells us anything about the witnesses other than their names. In most cases, the witnesses had testified as to where they reside and, in some cases, how far their residence was from the crime scene. This is true for all but eight of the 37 witnesses. This breaks down to four witnesses for the prosecution and four for the defendant. This had made sense with the prosecution witnesses when we look at who they were and what they had given testimony about. John Harrison Mullins had been Ira's juvenile son. S.T. Smith had only testified about his visit with Dr. Taylor at the jailhouse. Mulburn Gillum was the son of William Gillum and had testified about the same incident as his father. And W.B. Renfro had been the deputy sent to the Taswell, Virginia jail to retrieve Dr. Taylor and had given testimony about that incident. But the four defense witnesses whose residence was not established makes no sense. Mrs. Clifton Robinson and Mrs. Ellen Alley both gave testimony in which the establishment of their residence seems vital to the relevance and importance of the testimony. But the absence of the residence in the testimonies of John Robinson and Martin Branham combined with their complete irrelevance. This makes us believe that a good portion of what they may have testified about has been redacted. We also believe that the same thing occurred in the testimonies of Mrs. Robinson and Mrs. Alley. Addressing our skeptics. We know and fully understand that skeptics who have not spent as much time researching this case as we have will immediately scoff at this claim. We imagine that the most pressing question the skeptics would ask would be along the lines of, quote, What pray tell do you think may have been redacted from that testimony for the defense? Unquote. Our answer, of course, is, quote, The same thing that has been edited and or redacted from the testimony of prosecution witnesses every time that it had been brought up. Unquote. We are, of course, speaking about the events that had transpired just before the Pound Gap Massacre, and in particular, the incident which had occurred on Thursday, April 14, 1892. This incident is first mentioned in the transcript by Jemima Harris, but is testified about by multiple witnesses. Each time it appears in the transcript, it is simply referred to as, quote, someone shot into Ira's bed, unquote. Several of these testimonies, even among the prosecution witnesses, establish an alibi for Dr. Taylor. But we think the evidence for redaction actually appears in the transcript during the rebuttal phase of this trial. And we also believe that what was stated about the incident during the rebuttal may have been heavily redacted or edited itself. This belief comes from the newspaper articles from April 19th telling us about the incident, as well as an interview of a deputy sheriff shortly after the Pound Gap Massacre. 
These newspaper articles tell us a different story from the simple one told in the transcript. The Incident According to these articles, on April 14th, at least a dozen men surrounded Iris' cabin at the pound. These men shot the cabin up with at least one bullet striking the bed which Ira lay. The articles tell us that Ira Mullins narrowly escaped death because his family hid him in a wagon amongst his, quote, merchandise, unquote. This fact leads us to believe that Ira's cabin may have had an escape tunnel connected to the barn. But more importantly, these articles tell us that the April 14th shooting was over a land dispute in Virginia. This is interesting as a newspaper article, the often told story, and the Vanover family legend all tell us that Ira had been in Kentucky the week ending Friday, May 13th, 1892 because of a court case over a land dispute with the widow Vanover. After the death of Henry Vanover, the widow Vanover faced over 100 lawsuits related to the land holdings of her husband. According to some versions of the often told story, Dr. Marshall Benton Taylor gave testimony on behalf of the widow in many of these lawsuits. Returning now to the transcript of the trial, only one defense witness testifies about the April 14th shooting. This testimony firmly establishes Dr. Taylor's whereabouts on Thursday, April 14th, and provides a solid alibi for that incident. An interesting point here is that multiple witnesses come forward to state that Ira Mullins was trying to have Dr. Taylor killed. This probably rose from Taylor's time as a revenue agent and Ira seeking revenge. But it could have also arisen because Dr. Taylor was a witness against Mullins in the Vanover land dispute. And it could just well be over Ira accusing Dr. Taylor for the April 14th incident. As we stated, only one testimony is recorded for the defense about this incident. Yet, prosecutor Robert Bruce calls multiple witnesses in his rebuttal and questions them about this incident. The question is, why? Establishing that Ira had other enemies. The defense had discredited Jane Mullins and her testimony while she was on the stand. They had also opened their case with two strong witnesses who had further cast doubts on the testimony of Jane. They had then presented a witness who testified that the posse sent by Sheriff Holbrook to escort Taylor and the Flemings back to Wise had told her that they, the posse, had intended to kill Dr. Taylor. The defense had presented a total of three solid witnesses who had testified that Dr. Taylor and the Fleming brothers had never behaved as, quote, men on the run, unquote, prior to the botched arrest attempt by this posse which had been led by R.D. McFall. This fact had also been testified about by multiple prosecution witnesses as well. Now, with most of the remaining nine witnesses, we believe that the defense team was trying to establish that Ira Mullins had made multiple enemies in the state of Virginia and Kentucky, both as a moonshiner and as a land squatter. This is interesting in and of itself, because the only motive that would have made any sense in this case had to do with land. But, because of the timing and political situation in both Kentucky and Virginia, if this case had been about land on any level, it would have been damaging to both the local governments and the companies responsible for the new monetary investments in both states. But that is a topic for another video. The Testimony of John Robertson The witness testifies as follows, quote, I am acquainted with the reputation of Ira Mullins and the community in which he lived, and he had the reputation of being a dealer in illicit and moonshine liquor." Unquote. The Testimony of Martin Branham The witness testified that he was acquainted with Ira Mullins and his reputation in the community in which he lived, and that he, the said Ira Mullins, had a reputation of being a moonshiner and a dealer in illicit liquor and whiskey. This concludes the testimonies of John Robertson and Martin Branham. 
We at Kentucky Tennessee Living would like to thank you for reading and watching our series on the Killing Rock. Don't forget to hit that like button, as the more likes we receive, the more likely YouTube is to suggest our videos to other viewers. Also, to receive notifications of future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon for notifications. We thank you for continuing to support Kentucky Tennessee Living as we bring to you the history of the Appalachian Mountains. We must remind everyone that the story names Killing Rock, The Off-Told Tales, Killing Rock, The Untold Story, Killing Rock, The Trial, and Killing Rock, The Defense are all under Kentucky Tennessee Living Copyright.